Hello and welcome to Basecamp Climbing Magazine Podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Riley, and this is a bonus episode featuring an interview with Gary Neptune, the original owner and founder of Neptune Mountaineering, an iconic climbing and ski shop here in Boulder, Colorado. You know, if you're a climber and you've been to Boulder, chances are you've been to Neptune Mountaineering and know what a special shop it is. I was excited to speak with Gary because we recently shipped our annual gear guide that's available on newsstands now. And who better to speak to about gear than Gary Neptune, who for 40 years plus lived and breathed climbing gear. It was interesting to speak with Gary about the evolution of gear and retail over the years and how gear has changed the sport for better or worse. And we also discussed climbing ethics, climbing grades, and other various climbing-related topics. You know, Gary's an incredibly fascinating individual that has lived all over the world and has a wealth of knowledge about climbing history, and he's a really great storyteller. So I think you're going to enjoy the conversation, and we're going to get right to it. But first, a word from our sponsor. Locked in, turning his locks, and that looks good. Double back, you got pants, you got slings, you got some nuts. Ready to rock and roll. Sweet man. Climbing. Climb on. This episode is presented by Black Diamond Equipment. The world's best selling, most trusted cam just got better. Now 10% lighter, these bad boys feature a more modern design that gives climbers everything they love about the old Camelots with new touch points like a wider trigger for easier handling and an innovative trigger keeper for compact racking with sizes number 4, number 5, and number 6. For more information about the redesigned Camelot C4s, visit blackdiamondequipment.com. I'm with you. Uh, oh, man, nice fall. That was thin up there. Yeah, he just slipped out of it, huh? That was tough. Black Diamond. Live, climb, repeat. How do we want to start? <laughs> um, well, we'll I just, guess you start. I guess I will start. I'm yeah. Here, I'm here with uh, Gary Neptune from <laughs> Neptune Mountaineering. Thanks for stopping by, Gary. Really appreciate it. And, you know, I met you at the Outdoor Retailer Show. Right, yeah. Which was a great coincidence because for weeks I was actually like, hey, how do I get a hold of Gary Neptune? And I was talking to Matt Samet and definitely wanted yeah. to have you on the podcast. And then when I saw you there, you know, it's just, you know, a really great opportunity. But it also was somewhat surprising that you were at the Outdoor Retailer Show because you sold Neptune Mountaineering a while back ago i think that was like 2013 yeah 12 around. 13 that winter so that new year's eve or whatever we were up minutes to go and somebody's like when are we gonna sign these papers and start drinking because <laughs> <laughs> we've been on the phone with lawyers and all this uh-huh stuff anyway uh, we've got it done <laughs> sure sure so why do you still go to the outdoor retailer show is it to see friends to see new gear both oh all of that and i you know, if the store asks me anything, I want to be a little bit current about what I tell them I think of, uh-huh. of some gear or whatever. I don't work there and and don't interfere with what they do, but I certainly will be happy to talk about stuff. Okay. And, and do you have a feeling about the Outdoor Retailer Show? It's definitely come up in, in media, and I've seen a lot of blog posts about the relevance of the Outdoor Retailer Show and if it's a net positive or negative for the industry. As far yeah. as, you know, it just has such a large carbon footprint. It costs a lot of money. You know, is it still relevant in the industry that we're in now? That's a good question. A really good one. Um, apparently, uh, you know, talking to buyers and stuff, they get a whole lot of their work done before the show even. Uh-huh. More and more ever. There's all this lead time they seem to need. And I don't think it's necessarily that they need lead time, but they want to tie up your dollars before the other guy does. Yeah. And if you've got a particularly big account, they want to just meet with you in person for as long as it needs, not some little hour appointment or whatever. So uh, they do get a lot of their work done prior to that. But I also think meeting people, especially at every level of a company or the industry, um, just meeting with everybody at all those levels and talking to each other about things and what's going on is, is important. Mm-hmm. And I I do it because that was my life for forty years, well, yeah. more than that actually, and and uh, I enjoy it, and uh, I like being 
part of the whole thing sure, in a small sure. way. Yeah. Well, okay. So before we start talking about Neptune Mountaineering, which you opened in 1973, right. I wanted to get a little bit more information about you. You know, where did you come from? How did you get into climbing and skiing in the outdoors? <laughs> That's a kind of a long answer going to come up here. Well, it's a podcast. Yeah. We got time. I suppose. <laughs> um, from Oklahoma, and my dad was in the oil business, various jobs. And we moved uh, basically all my life. Never lived anywhere more than two and a half years. So mm-hmm. we bounced around all over the place. And uh, unfortunately, I, I had really bad asthma as a kid. Uh-huh. And it's come back in various times of my life. And it's a real pain they fortunately have a lot better medications and things now and you know when when i was a kid they end up in the hospital if he had bad asthma and that was miserable for a really young kid but one of the very fortunate times that uh worked for me really well i I was going to high school in indiana and the first year i the doctors actually prohibited me from participating in sports but the second year, I asked my parents, like, can you just get him to let me participate? Let me try. And uh, the coaches have to know that if I say I've got asthma and got to quit, they've got to let me quit. Mm-hmm. You know, not be tough and get through it. <laughs> and uh, that worked out well. Like, the problem there was that I'd grown up. Uh, when I grew up, I never learned to play any of the, <laughs> the team sports. Sure. So I couldn't do it anyway. Yeah. So I kind of gravitated towards trying to run. Uh, I remember in junior high, I had, for whatever reason, the school uh, had to do, I don't know, the whole school had to run a mile. Every sure, day. Yeah, I and had I, that. I was one of three kids that couldn't do it. Oh. <laughs> so that was sort of the story of my young life. I couldn't do any of that stuff. But in the 50s, when we moved to Egypt uh, for a while, that was the first time in my life, um, and I was around 10 years old, and my asthma cleared up. So that was a wonderful time in my life. And I was mm-hmm. running around with my best friend and we were climbing banyan trees and just playing around. There was so much to play in and, and every all the pyramids, everything was kind of open for anything. Wow. So we could do all that. And it was really thrilling. And the old museum was inspiring. And you know, of course, there was no Indiana Jones back then. Sure. But still, the, the effect was the same. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other thing that happened there when we during the period we moved to Egypt, Everest was climbed, the queen was coronated, all, mm-hmm. all those things. So we, and you were, you were hearing about this type of yeah, stuff. Yeah. And we right? actually saw a film at the movie. You had these newsreels before they would show a movie. Oh yeah. So one of them was a short one about climbing Mount Everest and all this stuff. And then, uh, my parents, our parents, uh, put us into a, a kind of a school in Switzerland for the summer. And, then the very next, uh, well, I don't remember the exact timing, but not long after that in the winter, we were in school in Egypt and pulled out of the classroom and all the kids, the foreign kids were lined up in the halls and eventually our parents picked us up. We were being evacuated uh, because of the Suez crisis in 1956. So there we are on the decks of the ships um, sailing over to Italy. Uh-huh. And, and the parents got together in hotels and tried to kind of keep the education going mm-hmm. in the hotel lobbies and so on in Naples first, then in Rome. And eventually, our pa- our parents put us back in the same summer schools, a proper school in the winter mm-hmm. uh, in uh, just above Lake Geneva, actually just across the valley from Les Ains, which some climbers will have heard about. And I was there with my best friend. He was a little older than I was. And his dad had been a skier and a climber and all that before World War II. So that was a little bit of inspiration. And this uh, Everest thing, and now here I was in the middle of mountains that I'd never seen a mountain before. Yeah. Because <laughs> we didn't live anywhere in the West mm-hmm. uh, or in the mountains in the East, for that matter. So all of that, those little things are formative. Well, uh, during back to high school in Indiana, since I couldn't really play these sports, I just kind of went to the gym and tried running. And I don't know how I got into it particularly, but I used to go go to the athletic director's office. He On his desk, he had a few books. And one was a gymnastics book. And I would borrow it every day and try to figure something out. Mm-hmm. And we and a few friends would join me. We learned a little bit of gymnastics that way. And, and that's the perfect years you're developing and all that. I became just generally very fit 
so I went from a, a kid who was failing the PE test the first year to being one of the best the school had ever had as far as just doing pull-ups or push-ups or something uh -huh. like that uh, and being able to play no sports whatsoever. Sure, sure. So uh, that's kind of how that went. But for whatever reason, and I never – I always wish I'd gone back and talked to some of these profs, but an, an anonymous alumnus uh, of the school – gave a scholarship to three kids and uh, to this new thing in the country called Outward Bound. Oh, cool. And they gave me one of them. Nice. And uh, I thought, well, I don't know why they did. That's the interesting thing. Uh, but I, I was very excited about it, and my parents thought it was an utter waste of time and didn't huh. want me to go. I needed to get a job. So I was just shattered by that. But finally, I convinced them that if I had a job lined up for the half of the summer after that, They'd let me go grudgingly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I did. It was in Colorado. It's the only place it was when it started. In, and what were they doing? Are they taking you backpacking and yeah, you up just, mountains and yeah, kind of that. It it was structured real differently. We had patrols and we spent more time at the base camp and going out from there. It was in Marble, it's still there. Okay, but often like Paul Petzold showed us, he was working there as before Knowles. And uh, he would show films from K2 in the 30s and uh, stuff like wow. that. There was an Indian instructor who had just been on an Indian expedition to Everest. And mm -hmm. uh, so we got doses. Harvey Carter was teaching there that <laughs> summer. So, you know, he would boulder on the walls and yeah. stuff like that. So it was really a pretty neat experience. Mm -hmm. And um, there we had one day of climbing instruction, basically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it wasn't any extensive climbing. But apparently I did well enough with, and Paul Petzl took several of us out and we climbed the North Ridge of Snowmass, which it turns out, I, as near as I can tell from what other people have said, it was um, a, probably a first ascent because Paul pounded the pitons in. Wow. And, um, and he had me lead the second rope. <laughs> and uh, so I'd clip them and bring the second group yeah. up. And I read it, where was I? I read it, in one of the magazines or something, uh, somebody did it and said, thought it was about five, seven and didn't know any more about it than that other than there were pins in it. And so as far as I know, that's what we did. Yeah. And that's a pretty significant so that was grade. Kind of, yeah. Yeah, I had no idea what any grades were. We yeah. never talked about them. And, and in the fifties in the United States, there was grading was a real vague thing. There was sort of a Teton grading system, which obviously Paul was familiar with, but he never, we never even talked about it. And did you feel an immediate connection oh, with yeah. the outdoors? Absolutely. Did you feel yeah. obsessed and know that that's I, kind it of was what wonderful. You, and I, yeah. it fell in, you know, I'd, I'd been doing this gymnastics and inventing it as I went along. Just I'd borrow the book every day and put it back on the desk. And uh, when I graduated, the, he gave it to me. Oh, cool. Still have it. Yeah, I didn't learn very much out of it either, but I, <laughs> all the basics I tried to get. So, we experimented a lot and we did a lot of things we shouldn't have done in this school, <laughs> but that's because I couldn't do any of the right things. Uh -huh. Yeah, I was, the Outward Bound thing was just a wonderful, huge step. So there was Switzerland and, and then there was this Outward Bound thing and it, that, I was hooked basically after that. And when did you make your way back to Boulder? Uh, so I late, imagine you went back to Indiana and well, a, a let's see. Of time between I'm trying them. to remember what, <laughs> where we lived when. As I graduated from there, I made the mistake of, at least for me, <laughs> of going to Rice uh, University in Houston, Okay, which was more or less torture because I <laughs> wasn't in the mountains. And yeah. The, the waves in that part of the Gulf, the water's dirty from the Mississippi and the waves aren't very good. And I made a surfboard, so I did a little bit of surfing and I, a little, well, I got some scuba gear, but you couldn't see anything in the water. So that was kind of worthless. So anyway, one... One of those summers in the late 50s, somewhere, I guess while I was going to high school, my friend from Egypt, his they were living in Denver, I think, at the time, because that's where his dad grew up mm -hmm. and so on. So I came and visited them, and we took the bus up here. To, the bus station was approximately where it is now, but it wasn't really a formal station. Yeah. There was a Dervener schnitzel across the street, <laughs> hot dog place. Anyway, there we walked up to behind the Flatirons, 
and climbed one of the little things behind the first flat iron. And I only, well, it's probably 20 years ago now or 10 years ago, I actually figured out what we scrambled up. And it wasn't that hard to climb up, but it's it actually, you go around a corner and suddenly it becomes extremely exposed. Mm -hmm. And there's a kind of a slippery groove that isn't hard to go up. But to, to scramble down that with no rope or anything, of course. Is that the sunset flat iron at? I have no idea. Uh, okay. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Um, anyway, that was quite spooky. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't real happy with that, but still, I the whole thing fascinated me. And mm -hmm. then, then there was Outward Bound, and uh, the uh, and, and like I say, my asthma came and went, and it it was pretty good through all that time at Rice, and I kept running and I, I kept up with some gymnastics and. There and, and where I went to grad school, basically wherever I was, if whatever gear they had, that's what I played on. So yeah. if they had a horizontal bar, then that's what I learned stuff on. If they had rings, well, then I tried that and, mm -hmm. and so on. And uh, and I, I remember at Rice, I, I used to jump work out with uh, two guys that uh, went to the Olympics in Tokyo. And, and Fred Hansen won a gold in the pole vault. And we were the three guys and the other, the other guy... Uh, I think it was Ed Red. He was a javelin thrower, but big, strong guy. And we 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 were the only three in the school that had permission to get the trampoline out. And the thing had a. It was one of those. It was made out of uh, kind of like woven bands of um, nylon, I guess, or poly, or whatever it was. And uh, one or two of them were broken on the side, so they were, the thing had a kind of a gap in it and yeah. it was very asymmetrical the way it would pop you up in the air <laughs> and no pads and yeah. all this stuff. I mean, it was really <laughs> primitive and that's the kind of stuff we did and uh but with that I figured out some things and learned some tumbling and taught myself a full t twisting backflip on the floor and stuff like that again no coaching or help and yeah but I yeah I just kept experimenting with things and became pretty strong during somewhere in the 60s i got to where i could do an iron cross and oh cool stuff like that uh and walk on my hands a long way and all that probably was part of what i'm paying the price for now <laughs> yeah. but uh anyway um i just kept getting stronger and then i started going up uh when did i well our, our first after our first year my friend from egypt and i had saved money from summer jobs and our parents encouraged us like they really wanted us to teach the value of saving for something mm -hmm. so we saved so that we could go over to europe and hitchhike around we were 17 or 18 then and a few kids did that and they loved europe i mean everything was so simple then there were hardly any cars on the roads even yeah because it wasn't that long after world war ii and so we did but the good side of that is my friend Rob had jo he joined the Colorado Mountain Club like his dad, and he knew Dale Johnson who was leading a CMC trip over there, and so I joined, just so that it would be a little more proper. And we we went over there and uh, backpacked from Innsbruck to Cortina, and then met these guys in Cortina. And uh, the very first day, well, well, they showed up. We got there a day ahead of them. And they showed up and Dale said, you know, to the groups like, okay, you guys all have the day off, get settled, go shopping, whatever you want to do. And then he turned to us. He had hired a guy, Peter Rowett from Scotland to help with his guiding because they wanted to do peaks, of course. They're uh -huh. Colorado people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he, he and Peter looked at us. He said, uh, you want to go climbing? And it was, of course we do. And, and I remember he said, you can you can climb grade something or other. I didn't didn't mean anything to me. And Rob said sure. <laughs> so we went over and uh, climbed the the Chima. Let's see what was it, the Chima Grande in the Cinque Torre group. Torre Grande. Okay. Uh, climbed a, a route over there, grade five. Yeah. Via Miriam and um, I've gone back and done it again. It's like gee whiz, that was something because all we had <laughs> was mountain boots. Yeah. And uh, it's so it's a good solid five seven mm -hmm. and uh but i managed to get up without falling which was i was dangling but yeah. nobody <laughs> could see it because there's overhangs in the dolomites uh -huh. so they thought we were good enough so we actually ended up co-leading all these trips that they these climbs they were doing or most of them many of them 
And I can remember going up to Marmalata and it, we're on this little bit of easy rock and having to hold this lady's feet on the holds while <laughs> Peter would be up above with a rope <laughs> and stuff like that. It was we had, we never had money for anything and yeah. so you'd get to the top and they'd give us sandwiches because they're probably sick from the altitude and, yeah yeah they couldn't they didn't want to eat so we ended up getting our <laughs> eating that way and uh and they they moved around and we always hitchhiked because they had rented some vans that were full and we generally got wherever they were going first and um ended up climbing the matterhorn he and i just did that by wow. ourselves with no rope climb Monte Rosa. So if we could mm-hmm. get with their group, we, of course we had a rope, but uh, that just didn't happen to work out that day. So we just did it ourselves and did fine. Yeah, yeah. Uh, eventually they were done with their thing and we somehow Dale, I don't know if he must have known this guy, British fellow, wish I knew his name. They he was He had some soldiers that he had brought over. He was training them from England. And they they wanted to go climb a thing called a beach horn, and so we went with them. And at that point, uh, I had bought a rope because uh, we just were kind of getting nervous climbing without a rope. And uh, we climbed the beach horn, and uh, he was supposed to be really good on snow and ice. And it was kind of funny coming down a little steep, icy part onto this glacier. We did we had a lot easier time than he did, and so oh well, <laughs> guess we were okay at that too. Yeah. I, I remember buying our crampons in Cortina. You went in, we went into La Cidelli's store. He had been one of the first ascent guys from K two, mm-hmm. and we bought our Gravel crampons, and then we took them down the street to the blacksmith, and he fit them to our boots just like a horse. <laughs> He'd heat them up and make them yeah. fit. So that's the way all that worked. Anyway, that was a huge introduction again to mountaineering. So. There's Paul Petzold and his mountaineering and this stuff. Mm-hmm. So it still wasn't particularly rock climbing oriented. We, sure. The rock climbing we did was really relatively easy, almost scrambling or whatever, low fifth class, I suppose. But we learned the rudiments of belaying and all this kind of stuff. After that, I was hooked. And every vacation seems like it was to Colorado. Yeah. <laughs> or we, we I remember driving down from Houston down to the Mexican Volcanoes. You know, that's a brutal thing to do from sea level, just mm-hmm. drive all the way down there, just tired out of your mind and get up early in the morning and go up <laughs> Popo or something. Wow, that was hard. But I again, I, I was curious at that point about all different kinds of climbing, and I kind of remained that way. And inevitably, you use specialized gear, and, and I found I enjoyed that stuff. Mm-hmm. And, I, and what I, was it about the gear that you really enjoyed? Uh, well, it, it allows you to do things. It, it expands your horizons. Uh-huh. Um, at least for me, that's what it did. I I didn't think in terms of using it to make something easier necessarily, but it uh, it allowed. I just changed the way I could approach things. If you have a rope and can belay and all that, it changes mm-hmm. what you can climb. Yeah, and uh, certainly the ice climbing tools allowed you to do things very differently from if you're just cutting steps, mm-hmm. which was kind of boring. Yeah, so so I enjoyed it, and, and then watching them, talking to them about what kind of crampons to buy, and then watching the blacksmith fit them to my boots, and all those little things, yeah, I, I enjoyed that a lot. And even then, I was beginning to learn Dale had some uh, chromoly pitons, and boy, if he put one in, he wanted it to come out, where it, <laughs> because they were expensive. Said, they yeah. cost a couple of dollars sure. instead of 20 cents, uh-huh. <laughs> it was that kind of thing. You know, so all that was was interesting to me, and I didn't. Mm-hmm. Nobody in that group or whatever, even, or for that matter, any books I read. And I was trying to read any book I could get, and there was virtually nothing on the market, especially in the United States, about climbing. There was a few books yeah. about Mount Everest, and that was about it. Sure. So nothing, none of the biographies, made it to the states. It hadn't been translated yet or got over there. So. You'd read Annapurna and think, oh, my God, that just sounds like one of the hardest <laughs> things you could ever do. And it was at the time. It was, uh-huh. uh, they were really hung out, strung out there. And the same with Everest. And But you did start to read about the different approaches to Everest because they were big and little expeditions. And so that it would certainly make you think about it a little bit. And, mm-hmm. and in retrospect, I mean, it's remarkable that they ever got up on that first ascent. 
putting in something like nine camps or however many it was you don't need nearly that many and Mm -hmm. one extra camp adds to the workload exponentially and you remove a camp and it reduces it and i think also people didn't realize how many people could go high without oxygen and um, work pretty hard and get the job done so and certainly the sherpas were not guides in that sense they were they were guides like the early guides around Chamonix. You'd go in there, they spoke a funny language that he, French couldn't understand for the most part, uh-huh. a funny dialect at least. And they they were the shepherds and the crystal gatherers and so on. And they knew the valleys and the ways to get here and there and where most of the trails were. But as far as actual climbing went, they didn't know anything about technical climbing. Uh, but if you go to Nepal, even today, we we found, well, I first went in 81, but I mean, little kids, you go bouldering and the next thing you know, they're crawling all over the rock like monkeys, barefoot <laughs> yeah. and everything. And you go, oh my God, this is amazing. Yeah. So anyway, we, uh, that was kind of thing. But when I, I started coming to Boulder, then now I knew a little bit. And I remember uh, summer of 1965, I went to summer school here, took mm-hmm. some geology courses and education courses. I was thinking maybe I'd be a teacher, which in retrospect, I probably should have. I could have <laughs> made more money and retired earlier <laughs> and had more time off but then in the we meantime. wouldn't have Neptune Mountaineer. Well, you wouldn't, but I sure would have had more time to climb. <laughs> Good for you, bad for us. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that, but I when I did that, I climbed, uh, did some rock climbing, not a ton. Climbed a few 14ers, that mm-hmm. kind of thing. I remember climbing in uh, Boulder Canyon. I've, I've climbed places in there that have never made the guidebook, and I found pitons stuck in the rock. So, I mean, yeah, those things were climbing. They probably weren't very hard. Uh-huh. And then the flat irons, I started climbing that kind of stuff. And I actually bought my first pair of rock climbing shoes that summer after. I found a picture on the top of the first flat iron, just a big pair of mountain boots, and that's all we had. Uh-huh. And so it must have been after that when I bought the, the Kronhoffers from Hollybar. So Hollybar was one of these uh, early manufacturers, made very high quality down gear and tents and that kind of thing. And they imported a lot of gear from Europe. European pitons and ice axes and so on. There was nothing in the States except for army surplus. And that was very heavy and for the most part not overly good mm-hmm. but the pitons were cheap and people use those you still see them around every now and then so they existed there was at that point one little teeny guidebook a little yellow thing and you look at it now and you realize they pretty much didn't know what grading was around here either they would uh, they it, well you read it and the grading just made little or no sense uh-huh. they would try to put a number on the hardest part of the climb they would try to give it a overall grade but they kind of mixed up aid and free and it just didn't make very much sense but you did get maybe a little sense that this was a hard climb and that one wasn't quite as hard in fact the oldest grading systems uh, were developed in the dolomites and they they had enough wealthy brits that would come over to climb uh, or maybe even germans or whatever the local guides kind of put together a list of climbs in just order of difficulty. So there it was. And yeah. if the client had done this one, he could probably do one near to that. Or if he's found that easy, he could jump up a little further. But And you could draw lines between that if you wanted to put a number on it, and then you had a proper grading system. Yeah, it was that simple. So that's where all the early grading systems really came from that. Mm-hmm. Over here, I used to climb quite a bit with Jim Glenn Denning from Estes Park. He did the first ascent of the Petigra Pond and Hallett Chimney, Zowie, yeah. things like that. Not hard climbs, but he could climb up to 5'8 in his combat boots mm-hmm. with little or no protection. <laughs> and they your way a, in the park. Yeah, and um, they would use a shoulder stand if they had to or whatever. They just mm-hmm. were trying to get up these things, but they had a at least in within some groups, and this is the only place I heard of it, they had a grading system that I really liked. There was a famous climb called Stettner's Ledges, done in the 20s by a couple of German immigrants. And it was it's 
a good, honest five seven, mm-hmm. and they uh, said, "Well, a climb's about like Stetner's ledges, or it's harder, or it's easier." Three grades, <laughs> and it actually works really well because that's that's sort of a grade four, grade five, grade six in the Alps, uh-huh. and that covered all of climbing for an awfully long time. Yeah. And it correlated with the Teton grades, which were pretty near identical to the climbs in the Alps. I don't know why all that ever got dropped, but because uh, the current system is, is kind of goofy and I think it over splits hairs. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's what's evolved sure, sure. around here. The rest of the world, for the most part, doesn't split hairs like they do <laughs> over here and then argue about what micro grade it is. <laughs> anyway... Where was I? <laughs> well, well, let me, I was I rambling want, about sure, all that. Sure, but we were talking about how you ended up in Boulder. Yeah, well, and... I, I, while I was going to Rice, the good thing is they had no field geology camp. and they, But there were other universities that did, and they had ones they approved of, and I chose the one in Colorado mm-hmm. from Texas Tech, actually. And I thoroughly enjoyed field geology. I was good at it and enjoyed it. And one day the prof came in and said, uh, we have a little problem here. Um, Doc Wade, who's been in Antarctica since the 30s with Admiral Byrd, he's always taking a grad student down there to work with him, and he doesn't have one this year. And so you all are invited to write an application and say why you should be the one. And I got the job. <laughs> so I, I got the job to go to Antarctica in the 60s and got paid to do it. And so once again, wow. and I got in a lot of trouble for climbing too. <laughs> You're not supposed to do that. And what we did in retrospect was pretty foolish, but we uh-huh. didn't know the difference anyway. <laughs> so once again there, and then while I was, and then I got a job, I failed my physical uh, because of asthma. It was during the Vietnam time. But, mm-hmm. And if I'd known I was going to fail, I would have probably uh, dropped out of school <laughs> to be a climber. Anyway, I stuck it out. I graduated from Rice, went to Texas Tech for three years. And the last year, I I just, uh, I knew I wasn't going to stay in geology or anything like that. I had to go to the mountains somehow. So I substitute taught a lot during the days, and I taught labs at night and was supposed to be writing my thesis. I did all the coursework and the project, but I never wrote the thesis and just disappeared (laughs) and came up here because I knew by that time I'd been up here a lot and I knew realistic I had to be realistic I had to have a decent job and any of the typical climbing places there are places where one could go climbing like after work or whatever they were little hamlets <laughs> mm-hmm. near the mountains or near a rock or something like that but they weren't really a place to build a future it didn't mm-hmm. seem uh, the manufacturers out in California where I thought, well, maybe some a bigger store or manufacturer would be an interesting related way to earn a living. Uh, there was almost no guiding back then, a little bit in the Tetons and a little bit on Mount Rainier, but most most people did climb on their own. So I ended up back in Boulder uh, because there was Holly Bar and Jerry, both manufacturers and retailers, mm-hmm. and I could go climbing after work. It's sure. perfect. Yeah. Can't beat that, <laughs> or bouldering, or something. Uh huh. So I did. And I got a, eventually got a job with Holly Bar, and worked there for a while. What were you doing there? Were you on the retail? I was floor on the or? retail floor, but fairly quickly in the winter they sold cross country skis, uh-huh. wooden wooden affairs, and I had seen those when we were hitchhiking around Europe. Didn't I didn't understand skiing much, but my friend friend Rob did, and every book I ever read about any of the old climbers in the winter, they all skied. Mm-hmm. so I, I just thought, well, that's another mountain thing a climber should probably do. And I was envious because he, d- he did it during winters, and I was stuck in Houston. <laughs> <laughs> not so, a lot of snow there. Not a lot. You know, it wasn't good. <laughs> so anyway, I got this job at Holly Bar and fairly quickly became the ski tech, and I would I actually sold a lot of skis, just people looking through the door and talking to me, and I'd tell them what to look for. They'd bring them back and said, does that look good? And so on. And I wouldn't even break the work. I'd just keep doing it and uh-huh. uh, sell the skis. But uh, I tried to learn all I could. Tried to visit with the guy who bought the gear. Uh-huh. 
that was very gear intensive, that kind of a job. And there really wasn't much climbing gear to sell as such. Mm -hmm. A few ropes and pitons, but not much else. Hollybar actually had some of the best pitons in the country, probably the best at the time made uh, nearby by a local blacksmith. Nice. And they had all these tests that, I mean, the eye would not break. It would pull out or something else would rip apart, uh-huh. but they were strong, good pitons. So when did you decide to open up your own shop? What was the catalyst well, that's, for that? Yeah, that that's, I remember when I worked at Holly Bar, it just, it was an odd time. There was a, just a, a short period that for whatever reason, there was a little bit of evolution going on and the shops like Jerry and, or Mountain Sports, Jerry Mountain Sports for a while. Mm-hmm. And Holly Bar, where I worked, they were just like, you guys spend way too much time with, cli- time with climbers. They never buy anything. <laughs> yeah. You know, we Some have, we have to change. sell stuff. <laughs> it, things don't change. <laughs> and uh, it, they were de-emphasizing climbing. And, and then Steve Comito opened his little shop on North Broadway, mm-hmm. fixing boots, which he would take months to fix them. So you pretty much had to have two pair of boots so you could <laughs> trade them back and forth. And he sold a little tiny bit of climbing gear because there wasn't hardly anything on the market. Mm-hmm. And But he seemed to know the scene, at least somewhat. So I remember going in there, but then after a couple of years, he moved up to Estes Park. And so that left a void. And Bob Culp opened the Boulder Mountaineer. But anyway, with the other stores de-emphasizing, I, mm-hmm. and if, I never would open a store if Comito had stayed or yeah. whatever. And the Boulder Mountaineer was, well, got, Bob had been guiding for years. I don't know how much he got to guide, but little bits. And if you have one town and one guide in the in all of Boulder, that's probably enough business. But sure. business, climbing business was just a micro business back then. Yeah, I was looking around. We were talking about it a little bit when you first walked in, but there weren't a lot of climbing shops around the country. You no, know? Dick no. Dick Williams had his shop starting in the 1970 yeah. at Rock and Snow. But other than that, there really wasn't much around. Right. And there was surplus gear. And REI had started before World War II. And they, but they had basically really cheap stuff as mm-hmm. bad or, or maybe worse than Army gear. I don't know. They, <laughs> they, were, they were kind of a different sort of place. But they sure. at least imported some stuff. But Holly Barr and Jerry tried to import better stuff. And after the war, the selection began to get better. And they, of course, manufactured their own clothing. So that fairly soon became competitive with anything from Europe. Then while I worked for Hollybar, uh, Chenard was kind of beginning to get the reputation for having the best gear, mm-hmm. but that still wasn't much. He didn't even have the full range of pitons at that point. Yeah. And every year he'd add another one or two and we'd get all excited about that. <laughs> and then uh, finally he started producing nuts. And that is one of those pieces of gear that really changed the face of climbing Mm -hmm. not the outdoor industry necessarily but climbing for sure and doug robinson wrote this incredible article and and they put it in the catalog they they were willing to have a catalog that had a lot of stuff that wasn't just selling a product Uh and uh this article basically in the most wonderful way described the beauty of this simple climbing without a hammer, just climbing with nuts and slings and in such a natural way, a more natural way, put it that way. And I remember talking to Royal Robbins not not long after that, and he said it's the only time he could remember where climbers voluntarily sort of in mass chose the more difficult way to climb, mm-hmm. not the easier way. Because <laughs> up until then, every new tool made something easier. And they might tackle a bigger thing but they were never when the first nuts came out that selection was so poor that to give up pitons was really a committing thing Mm -hmm. yet climbers did it now a lot of us did it by buying a set of nuts and always having a few pitons hung on us somewhere just in case and we virtually never used them we found out we didn't need them Uh but we always had them and had that hammer and we would help the nuts stay put sometimes Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, Chenard came out with that uh, crag hammer. It was basically, uh, I remember just before that came out, I'd broken the pick off one of his ice hammers. And so I had one and I was using it just like that. 
Uh-huh. And I imagine other people did the same thing. <laughs> uh, and so he thought that was a good enough idea. And that way you could get nuts out much better. So sure. they, they were stuck less and so on. Yeah. And that's one of those nice evolution things where, you know, it furthered the ethics of climbing and leave no trace. But yeah. at the same time, also allowed climbers to move more lightly in the mountains. Yeah. yeah. And actually kind of evolve the technical side of the sport. Right. Yeah, it was a really interesting evolution that affected a number of things. And um, because, for instance, if you really think about it, it, the fact that something is climbed free means you don't actually need, well, in theory, any gear. Sure. And you certainly don't need pre-fixed gear. Mm -hmm. You don't need to put a bolt in to then do something free wait a generation somebody's going to do it don't <laughs> yeah. I, I think and this gets down to what i one of the evolutions the the power drills that really made it too easy it's kind of really it's the whole gen climbers are kind of greedy they, they want these first ascents mm-hmm. and they'll do anything to get the first ascent sure and i never liked the idea of doing an ascent but top roping it first and doing all that that wasn't climbing to me mm-hmm. still isn't <laughs> it's i mean i bouldered i love to boulder and i that's a whole different thing the rules kind of you can make different rules while you boulder mm-hmm. one day you may go up there and try to do everything on site and not fall say a new boulder or something or you may work on a problem for years i've done that and finally achieved it and i was all happy about it and i'd see other people do it and i had all the I knew about it. I knew everything I needed to know. I just couldn't necessarily do it. So there are so many ways to tackle those things. Or top rope them first, and then you boulder it or high ball it or whatever. Yeah, yeah. But uh, to do all these climbs, you know, bring it down to your level because that's what putting a fixed anchor is for sure. Mm -hmm. Uh, To bring it down to your level so you can do it first. Just stole it from a gen, you know, one generation later and. I remember asking John Backer a long time ago, and Royal Robbins said, do you think there are any routes on El Cap you could climb with no bolts? Backer thought about it a minute and said, yeah, I can think of several right now. All you got to be able to do is run out 510 to do it. And there are plenty of people that can do that. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But that just nobody thought about that or nobody picked up on it and thought, well, that's maybe a better way to climb. Only using what Mother Nature gives you. Mm Mm-hmm. And Royal Robbins thought about it, and he was really kind of troubled because, like, when he did the second ascent of the nose, they chopped about 100 bolts. Yeah. Because And the, the ethic back then, if you want to call it that, is if you can climb it without a bolt, you should take the bolt out, mm-hmm. which you don't do that now. Uh, people get really angry. But <laughs> yeah. anyway, they did, and they, you know, they up, up the ante, up the mm-hmm. standard, and that was the better way to do it. But the fact that he never could, he never climbed without bolts. He always, he was willing to put in the odd bolt here and there because, and he was better than probably probably anybody else at avoiding the bolts, but he Mm -hmm. still put them in. Yeah. (laughs) So he still wasn't willing to not do the North America wall or not do something. And he, Mm -hmm. I love doing some of those old climbs and going, my God, those guys were so sparing with the bolts. It's, they were, they were having a fun game. Uh Uh-huh. And they really tried like hell not to. And then there were other people that just didn't really care. Yeah. So that's, but that's just gone out the window these days. It, you know, it's once it's a mass sport, people are looking at a whole different thing. It's, and really the power drill is what sort of created sport climbing more than anything. Because the, if you're just hand drilling, you're, you're really limited what you can do. Sure. Well, cams must have changed the game quite well, a bit. Well, and cams saved a lot of rock. They saved Yosemite and probably El Dorado and a lot of other things yeah. because they allowed, particularly in Yosemite, protection. I mean, go to Europe, you see bolts right next to cracks. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and they didn't quite get over here. You know, unfortunately, the, the friends came out first, and it was very clear they did a great job of it. So all of a sudden... They and they did make things easier for sure, but they allowed people to start realistically thinking about bigger, faster, harder, and all that expand their horizons. 
And uh, they saved the crags from excessive bolting, for sure. Yeah. So how has the outdoor retail landscape changed since you opened your doors in 1973? It's a bit of an obvious question, but you might have a you know, a unique perspective on it. (laughs) Sure. Yeah, I was there. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Basically, uh, there was very little, almost no climbing market Uh and almost no cross-country ski market. There were a few backpackers and campers and all that. It was a small, small market. And many of the good stores in the country were part of uh, manufacturers. They had, in a way, it was a factory store. And they maybe sold other stuff too, but that's it was very small, very specialized. So that that made those stores really special. It was fun to go to a the Tetons and go into Teton Mountaineering or something uh-huh. like that and talk about the climbs a little bit. REI was not all over the country. Nobody was, uh, even the even the REIs and the LL Beans and all that. They were small and by virtue of even. Like L.L. Bean, for instance, and NRAI, too, they had big mail order operations by that time, but it's mail. It's slow. You waited for the catalog, You, and that was all exciting if you were going to school in Houston to get a catalog for anybody and dream about your next adventure mm-hmm. and the gear you might need for it. That was a pretty exciting thing. Yeah, it was a very small, small market and a specialty store. If you, if you were competent at what you were doing, uh, could make a go of it. You'd never get rich doing that. Uh-huh. I don't think anybody ever did. <laughs> the the businesses got bigger and sure people. Some people got well got got kind of rich and some went broke and uh-huh. so on. I I left out uh, the other place in town. The other manufacturer was um, Alpine Designs. Alp Sport was the store. But it, it never the retail end of that business never really took off. Mm-hmm. But Alpsport uh, grew quite a bit, George Lamb, and uh, or Alpine Designs that was the manufacturing. He made some really good gear, very creative fellow and, and a climber. But now <clears throat> all these little stores they began to spring up anywhere there was any business, and, sure. and then REI began to expand. Their story was that they would look and see where their mail order business was. And if there was no store there, if it was big enough, they'd open a store there. Mm-hmm. Very logical and didn't hurt anybody. And and in later years, Boulder was the first place they moved into and knew they were going to put people out of business. Mm-hmm. Because Boulder was saturated with stores. And I think four different doors closed, something like within a year. I think it was, oh, maybe it was within three years. I think it was three years. It was really rough for me because every store that closes is just giving away their same stuff I sold. Sure, yeah. And man, it was hard. They almost put me out of business in that. Except I was more stubborn, I guess. I wanted to keep doing it. (laughs) Yeah. And so what did you do to kind of combat, you know, that competition? I just had to tighten my belt. Yeah. Because I, my whole business model was really, a lot of things about it were simple. It was basically cash. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, I didn't borrow money from the bank or any of that kind of stuff. I didn't, I was very averse to debt, other than you had to have short-term debt with your vendors. And um, that kept it really small. I did all the bookkeeping. I tried to have a store that I would like to come into to shop, and I tried to, tried to make it a place where I'd like to work, that kind yeah. of a store. And I knew other stores so I kind of knew sort of what I wanted and it wasn't a store for everybody for sure and it wasn't this place like I'd tell people that look I'm not going to be a slave driver you need to be kind of self-motivated and if you don't work reasonably hard this isn't the place for you and you got to figure it out kind of by yourself Uh so that was kind of the way we took it and we in the early days, of course, we could put a sign on the door saying gone climbing <laughs> for the day <laughs> and uh, or skiing or something like that. You really can't do that now with the whole staff. But And, you know, it seemed like there was a lot of consolidation when REI really started growing, as you kind of mentioned. Yeah. You, had, you know, the online retail really exploded around 2000. You have right. Backcountry. Now you have Amazon. Yeah. Um, so there has been a, a large consolidation, but it's been great to see because I actually started 
you know, work in outdoor retail in high school. Uh-huh. I worked at Moose Jaw, one of the, the oh, okay. original Moose Jaw Mountaineerings. Yeah. Worked at Adventure Outfitters. In, is that and, in Nebraska? No, so no. Moose Jaw is actually out of Detroit. Oh, okay. And, um, you know, I loved retail shops. You know, whenever I was going climbing or backpacking, I wanted to go to the local retail store. Oh, me too. But I feel like the community lost the connection with the stores for a while and it was all about convenience and price and i feel like it's actually started to change and and neptune now is doing such a phenomenal job and you see the stores that do offer events they're successful and the community is willing to pay more a little bit more for you know having that connection to a local shop instead of just buying on price yeah, um, online or at a big box store. So it's been really nice to see those kind of core shops be able to survive and thrive in the current situation that we're all in. <laughs> I hope they are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it really is tough because something, whatever you want is on sale somewhere, mm-hmm. it seems. Um, and that, that's tough. It used to be, it wasn't, nobody ever competed on price. Yeah. You know, we had three or four stores in town and price was never the, the thing you went to your favorite store because you liked their style uh-huh. or whatever their selection. But yeah, with the big mail order places, it's a problem. And the other twist to that too is Boulder. It's like, I bet half of Boulder is a pro. Yeah. <laughs> and not rightly so. I, I have <laughs> a problem with that. I, I remember climbing with a girl at, worked at a gym two hours a week and she got a bazillion pro deals and that's wrong. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite things about visiting (laughs) Neptune was the um, museum, the climbing museum. (laughs) I mean, you guys had, you know, all different types of artifacts. It was an extensive collection. Do you have a favorite piece that you had in that museum? Well, hmm. (laughs) What I've mostly tried to do with the museum, I'm not a collector of just everything possible. Mm-hmm. Like I have a lot of books at home, but not every climbing book because I don't like every one. Yeah. But I have reasons for the ones I have. The museum is the same thing. I try to have pieces that can tell a story or be part of an assemblage. And, and I don't need every carabiner Chouinard ever made. Mm-hmm. But if there was some key uh, change or invention or twist of the whole thing then i could make a display that would tell a story perhaps that's one of the things on my list i'm so glad the new you know the dunbars have the store and have given me some space to put this stuff in and still got lots of museum to go back in but at least it's up and kind of looking okay Uh without any labels yeah but um it'll get there (laughs) i'm not getting paid to do it so i I, you know it's a little bit slow, but I, I enjoy doing it when I'm working on it. And we have a lot of ideas for new displays, perhaps some rotating things. Mm-hmm. But back to your question, I've got <laughs> one of the weirder things is an entire big toe. What? <laughs> yeah, fro- that was frozen on Long's Peak. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, and it's in a little bottle, <laughs> a little jar thing. Um and uh, that's kind of novel. Was that found on Long no, Peak? No, no, no. The, the guy, he, he in? brought it in. <laughs> Whoa. Yeah, you can see the toenail on it. <laughs> that's kind of novel and special. Yeah, uh, but also one of the really special items, maybe the most special, is uh, uh, Peter Hobbler's down suit from the first of Santa Everest with no oxygen. Wow. He gave that to me. Mm-hmm. That's really special. Yeah, that's There's only one of those. <laughs> Yeah, that is incredible. Um, and in fact, he recently, <laughs> I took it over there and they had it for a while. Messner was is making a documentary about that climb. Mm-hmm. And Peter's son, Chris, was wearing it, being Peter, that kind of yeah. thing. And uh, anyway, I've got it back in the store now. It's always sad when it's missing, but there have been a couple of occasions that it was out of there for a while. So there's that. And then there's also a boot from uh, the first ascent of Mount Everest, Hillary's expedition. It's not Hillary's boot. But he signed this one. It was a, a Sherpa gave me that one, and a crampon. Uh-huh. Uh, the pair, the other half of the, that pair is in Italy now at uh, Gravel's little museum. Huh. Interesting. So that's pretty special because they were the big, they were the crampon company after World War II. Uh huh. They're really, perhaps you could say before, but uh, the Germans made a lot of crampons too. They were big into ice climbing, so mm-hmm. so that stuff's there and. Uh, 
Then another thing that's kind of near and dear to my heart, it's in a way it's a little less special, but I just happened over the years to have come to know three different people who were on Nagaparbat in 1932. Wow. Um, Petzl wasn't there till 38. Uh-huh. But 1932, and that was Elizabeth Knowlton, Fritz Wiesner, and Peter Aschenbrenner, mm. who was an extremely prolific, very, very good climber. Uh, he's an Austrian and climbed really hard rock, but he was often known as Himalaya Peter because he went to Nagaparbat three times. Uh huh. In uh, 32, 34, and 53, something like that. Anyway, um, but I, when I got to meet him, I got him to autograph an ice axe that he designed in the er, around 1930. And with very, very small changes, they produced that thing clear up into the, through the 60s into the 70s probably, mm -hmm. somewhere in there. And it's a heck of a good ice axe. Yeah. It doesn't look all that modern, but uh -huh. there were subtle things about it that made it extremely good. And I actually used that in a similar north wall hammer uh, to climb the designator. I mean, it worked that good. Wow. And that brings me to another piece of gear or technology that really changed climbing. And everybody gets all excited about these droop tools and all this other stuff. But I think the biggest change... And it really, a lot of those things are very important, but it's protection. Mm -hmm. They were, Heckmeyer told us, told me, I knew him fairly well, stayed with him and stuff. And, and he said, yeah, we were drooping tools and all that stuff to climb ice, but no protection. Yeah. So there's just a limit to what you're going to do with no protection. Sure. It doesn't matter how good your ice tools are. Yeah. At least at the time when you're kind of inventing the sport. Mm -hmm. So, and good ice screws didn't really begin to happen until really the 70s. Uh -huh. Before that, they had these hideous little corkscrew affairs and things like that, uh -huh. or, or just ice pitons from the 20s, but that they were pretty awful, really. Yeah. So what are you up to these days, most of the time? <laughs> well, I, I'm climbing a lot less than I would like to be climbing, but uh -huh. uh, after I sold the store, I got good insurance for the first time in my life. <laughs> And had some old uh, orthopedic injuries repaired. Uh -huh. And it uh, the big one, the ankle, that one took months to get over. Actually, it took close to three years to heal. Yeah. You know, when you're in your 70s, you don't heal very fast. <laughs> yeah. one, one of my doctors, he looked me in the eye and he said, remember, you're no spring chicken. <laughs> Thanks, I needed to hear that. So that and uh, the guy that looked, worked on my knee... Uh, he said afterwards, he said, I can identify at least four things you've done to your knee. Yeah. <laughs> but we fixed them as, you know, I think it's good for, you got a little less of everything, but it's still all your parts. Mm -hmm. And then the other one was, a, uh, I had, I've got a fused thumb now, which is not nice, you know, it's, yeah. but, but it got rid of a lot of pain and so on. It's better, much better than it was. And the only remaining thing is an old wrist injury that was repaired about 20 years ago, but it's that hand is really suffering. It's mm -hmm. I have a lot of pain in that wrist and it's not very flexible and so on, and that interferes. Although during that time, I've been able to still climb, had been able to climb pretty hard, and uh, you know at this point I you know I thoroughly enjoy five sevens, and if sure. I if I were climbing a lot, I'd certainly be enjoying harder than that. Uh -huh. But there are limitations, and uh, the, if if I use that hand, one hand and wrist, like I I was putting up some paneling in, in our house and stuff like that, and sawing and hammering and all the stuff, and and uh, boy, that hand just got cranky. So mm -hmm. the idea of a really long climb, I I don't know what I could do. I haven't work back into that mm -hmm. to see what I can or can't do. And the, the fused thumb hand doesn't have quite the range of expansions like a cam with less range. <laughs> so I can't fit it into the crack. Like the right hand will go yeah. in, but the left one won't fit that one. And, and with a stiff wrist, you can't, like you can see it. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's yeah. stiff. So that really limits what you can do. <laughs> mm -hmm. So those things are kind of a pain. Some things they don't interfere with at all, and yeah. other things they... Definitely do. You get out and cross cross country ski. Yeah, I've been doing a lot of that. Got now that the ankle is better than it's been in decades, 
back into skiing some marathons and stuff pretty mm-hmm. dang slowly because man when you're <laughs> like i say when you're old and you ba- more or less take a year off before the doc said okay now you can go try to hike around mont blanc and i barely could do it it hurt so bad uh. so that was a year after that surgery and um but anyway back then something i can do with my wife so we've been training a little bit and skiing a couple of marathons over in europe and that kind of thing. So that's that's just good for fitness. I'm just trying to generally get back in shape, mm-hmm. and uh, hopefully this summer do some more climbing. But it's well, we moved, and <laughs> that really we still haven't got things all unboxed yet, and it's been over a year. Mm-hmm. So anyway, we've kept busy with that. When the new owners, you know, when the Dunbars got the store, uh, that took up a huge amount of time to try to put the museum back in. And it, I took it out so fast that it was all disorganized and it was stored in four or five different places. And the nature of the displays and the layout of the store now is different than it was, so I can't have all the same displays. Mm-hmm. So everything had to be thought about in a different way and reassembled and all the parts found. It's a lot of work. So very time-consuming to get that done. Now that spaces are shrinking and we're... And I've in there all the stuff's in their warehouse or nearly all of it and it's in kind of in boxes but in order now so we can if we want to put a harness display in they're all in the same place Mm -hmm. (laughs) instead of scattered around (laughs) so that that's i think we'll we'll see things like that at single displays will appear in a fairly Mm -hmm. short time that kind of stuff Great. Well, thank you so much for stopping by. It's been a really fun conversation. And thank you for everything you've done for the community here in Boulder and, you know, for everything you're doing with the museum. Well, thanks. And I, speaking of everything I did for the museum it, or for the, the community in Boulder, I, I never fully understood that until after the store kind of went belly up. Yeah. <laughs> and then it's like everybody is uh, is happy it's back and they appreciate what I did for sure and so on and I never I guess fully realized that and it's <laughs> it's gratifying to, yeah. to think that and I don't think I well I know for a fact I couldn't have taken it to this next level so I'm really glad the Dunbars are doing mm-hmm. that and it isn't just some group of greedy investors that really couldn't care less about the store or anything else they care they, no they the shop looks and, great all right well thank you so much sure Well, that's the show. I want to thank Gary Neptune for being on the show. I also want to thank our presenting sponsor, Black Diamond Equipment, for helping to make all this happen. Make sure you check out their new C4s with the Trigger Keeper feature, which is super rad at blackdiamondequipment.com. Our theme music was provided by Small Houses at smallhouses.band. That's it, everybody. See you at the next base camp.